Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, talk about this tool that I really, really like, S-Trace. It's something that I use on a daily basis. Um, how many of you ever tried to use S-Trace? How many of you <laughs> thought it was gibberish and swore not to use it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's more or less what happened to me in the uh, what happened to me in the beginning. That that's what happened to everyone, and um, you know, at my work, I work in uh, in the HPC department in, at Intel, and um, uh, people were always treating me like I was some kind of asterisk whisperer, like you know, like I'm the only one that could understand its output, and they thought like I was born with this inherent ability to just understand what it tells me. But it doesn't, it didn't. Um, so first of all, I use a lot um, in my presentations uh, uh, two met metaphors, because I'm really passionate about troubleshooting and debugging and, uh, and uh, all of this. And I, one of the metaphors I use is detective investigation, where you always uh, follow your leads. You know, you, you have one lead, which uh, leads you to, to to another one to like you know fo follow the evidence trail, uh, but with asteroids it's more like medical diagnosis because you're just looking at one thing you're just looking at a, at a single object you're looking at the process and you're trying to understand what happens inside you want to like take an X-ray of it over time to see what what exactly it's doing where the where everything flows inside the body. So. As I, as I said, once upon a time, S-Trace with me, for me, was, was like that. Have you ever seen Matrix? You know, so uh, sometimes there were engineers. Uh, I started as an intern in Intel in a, um, in a monitoring uh, center, uh, monitoring control center. And sometimes an engineer would come and he would run S-Trace. And I thought, like, in, in the movie, Neil like looks at the screen and he says, "Do you see her anything?" And and the other character says, "Yes, like right here, I see a woman in a red dress uh, eating ice cream or something." So I thought, "Wow, that's what they see there." So when I started in this uh, as an intern there, um, the only way we knew how to use S trace or was when it got stuck, when something got stuck, and we could see where it got stuck. So uh, we use a lot of NFS. Uh, in our in our data center, and sometimes one of the filers were uh, one of the file servers was down, so we were just running S trace df, and we saw okay cool so the stat for this this uh, for uh, here worked here worked and then it got stuck on disk nine, so we just had to check what was disk nine and that's it that's the only thing we knew what uh, we, we knew how to use S trace if it didn't get stuck. Estrus was, was, use, uh, was useless for us. <laughs> we just didn't know how to continue. Um, a few years later, uh, after uh, four years after I started as an intern, I got uh, into a, a full-time engineer position. And one of my first tasks, you know, so we're um, in, in, in my position. Our customers are the chip designers, right? Like they're the ones that are using the machines and data centers to. Uh, to run uh, uh, simulations and, uh, and uh, regressions and stuff like that. So we would support those customers. And my boss came to me and she said, uh, uh, one of our customers, uh, uh, he has a problem. One of, those, uh, of his tools is running really slow. Um, so maybe you could check. So I said, OK, I'll try to run S-Trace. If I, if I have any luck, I it would get stuck somewhere. And, and I would say, yeah, here's the problem. So I run asterisk, and that's what I saw. I saw weight minus one. I had no idea what it means. Like I came, so I came to my boss, <laughs> and I told her it's waiting for something. I have no idea what it's waiting for. I think maybe it's a bug in the code. I think the code is just tr waiting for something to happen, and uh, uh, and they need to look like they they they. The, the, the developer of the code needs to see, to, to know what it waits for. Anyone here knows what wait actually means? OK, so we'll go into that later, and you'll, and you'll understand how stupid that was. 
But anyway, that's how I started. I started like everyone. Like for me, it was nothing. And the thing that changed everything was a few months into my uh, full-time engineering uh, uh, role, I got into a course about Linux programming. And in this, and there we started, I started learning about what system call is. Like I knew something about S-trace showing system call. Probably I just ran man S-trace and it said system call and I said, okay, whatever, system call. But I didn't actually know what system call was back then. And when I went to this uh, uh, system programming, Linux system programming course, uh, that's when everything started to make sense. So first of all, what a system call is. A system call is the interface between the application and the Linux kernel, okay? Uh, what is the kernel? The kernel is the one that uh, is the proxy between the program and the hardware. Um, it gives you access to the disk, to the memory, to the I.O., to the uh, keyboard, uh, to, uh, to the CPU, of course, right? Uh, to uh, all of that. Um, when you want to start a process, you ask the kernel, please start a process. When you want to um, uh, start running something, you tell the kernel, please run this binary with those um, uh, arguments and everything. Um, so you interact with the kernel using system calls. Everything, uh, everything you do, if you want to run it, you just run a command saying exec. If you need memory, you run a command uh, saying uh, mmap or something, something like that. So that's system call. Uh, and another thing I learned there is that every system call has an entry in the man, man pages. Um, you just run, uh, it's in section two of the main pages, that's the section of the system calls. And you can learn everything, uh, uh, um, everything about it, everything you need to know. So for instance, if I see uh, wait, wait, something called wait for minus one, I just run man to wait for, and I see what it means, which is something I just haven't thought of before that, <laughs> you know. Um, there's a difference between a, a system call and library call. I, I won't go re like really into it right now because I don't have time, but uh, just so you know, many of the, of the things that you might think are system calls are not. Like for instance, if you're uh, programming, you probably used malloc, right? Uh, to allocate memory. And in Linux today, malloc is a library call. It's a wrapper, which usually uses mmap system call behind the scenes. Um, but, and there, there's also an equivalent for asterisk for library calls, with, uh, which is called ltrace, but we won't get there right now. So anyway, after this course, that was, without exaggerating, that was a moment that changed my life forever. <laughs> and I went from zero to hero. <laughs> <laughs> like suddenly I could see through the matrix. That's how I felt. So what is S3? So it's a tool that, uh, that traces the system calls and the signal of every process, right? It shows um, which system calls it runs and uh, which, signals, uh, which signals it receives. Uh, you, could attach, uh, you can attach it to a process that's already running or you could run some specific command with S trace, and S trace will attach to this command until the command finishes, and then S trace will finish as well. Um, so as I said, it intercepts and records all the system calls and the, the signals. Um, you could see the name of every system call and the arguments that were passed to it, and also the return val value. Uh, by default, it writes everything to the uh, standard error, uh, STD2, file skipper 2, uh, sorry, like file skipper 2, the uh, standard error, or you could uh, write the output to a file using the minus uh, dash O option. Um, we'll see all that later. So why S-Trace? There are, uh, everything here, I think I, I think I just took, took it from the man page of S-Trace or from the info page or something, but there are, uh, Three specific use cases for, uh, for that. First of all, it's good for diagnostic and debugging. Something doesn't work, you want to know why it doesn't work, so you run S trace. Um, the, uh, the process doesn't work the way you think it, it, it should work, it's getting stuck, it's slow, it's showing a different output than the, what you expect. You run S trace to see what it's doing behind the scenes, and it might give you a lot of insights. Um, also, 
uh, if you want to learn about the, about, the, uh, about the OS, about Linux, you use uh, S-Trace. To, uh, because, uh, a g great deal can be learned for, about the system and its system calls by tracing even ordinary programs. And when I said that S-Trace changed my life, it wasn't just because it helped me for debugging or troubleshooting. It's because every time I didn't understand how something worked, I just ran S-Trace on this process and I learned how it worked. You know, sometimes it would be easier for me even to then uh, reading the man page of, a, um, of some program uh, that might explain you know, the theory and uh, how it works. It was easier for me to just run SRS and see, oh, okay, it opens this file, it reads this file, then it's, uh, it goes to this socket, it opens it, this socket, it runs something there, it reads it, okay, now it makes sense. You know? So I use it a lot just to understand how things work. And that's why I use it on a daily basis. Every time I don't know why something works, I use s -rays. And of course, if you're a programmer, uh, it's really nice for uh, bug, bug isolation, you know, uh, sanity checking. Um, uh, if you want to try to capture race conditions, then you try like to somehow achieve this race condition and then see behind the scenes in s -rays what it's doing and maybe think of what could, like, what could go wrong there? Um, okay, this, there are a lot of s -trace flags. All of those flags here, I will explain them. I, I will explain why I recommend using them. And I really suggest that every time you run s -trace, you use those flags. Again, I will explain later why, but when uh, the first time I, I delivered like this presentation, it was at work, and at work a lot of people they when a process didn't uh, something they had a problem with the process if uh, it, uh, it, it was too slow or something, they would run S trace on this process, save it into a file because they knew the dash o option here, and then they told me look into this file like they knew okay, we don't know how to use S-Trace, you're the master, so we'll save S-Trace in the file, we're sure we did a great job because we just ran S-Trace dash P with the process and dash O into a file, you have all of, the, all of the information there. And I would say, no, I need the timestamps, I need to know how long it uh, was, uh, it spent in every, uh, in every system call, I need to uh, see exactly uh, the translation of the file descriptors to a file, no. So then when I, when I did this first presentation there, that was a good opportunity for me to tell them, you see those commands here? Save them someone, write them down. From now on, every time you run s -trace, you will run it like that. You will see that when you run it like that, many times you won't even need my help because it will make things easier for you. But even if you don't, at least for me, it would be much easier. Uh, so again, dash F for children because uh, when um, by default s -race only looks at the process, but if it spawns another children using fork or clone or whatever, it will not trace the child. So dash F will, trace, uh, will, will trace all the children. Dash S, you will see that sometimes it limits the string size uh, and you would like to, to, improve, uh, to, to, to increase them, to increase the, the string size it shows. Dash O, as I said, you write, uh, the informa you write the output of s -race into a file instead of a, a standard error. Uh, dash TT, it prefixes every line with a timestamp. Dash capital T um, shows you how long it's spent in every system call. Again, and don't worry, I will show you each and every of those, uh, each, uh, each one of those flags exactly what it's doing and how it's helpful for you. Um, but you know what, let's just continue. So. Hope you're ready for action. We'll start with something fairly easy. You probably all know the cat command, right? Oh, you want to see the content of a file. So I run s trace cat on some file. And when I just run it like that, boom, like I got a lot of information. And this is a fairly simple command, right? Like uh, it, it doesn't have hundreds of lines in s trace, but even here, it's difficult to analyze it, not to mention that it gets uh, uh, mangled with, with the actual output of cat. Like, so here you can see it reads something and it writes something, 
but then somehow, but then somewhere in the middle, you see the actual output of cat, and then you see again the end of the system call. So it's really difficult to do that. So that's why every time you run S trace, it's better if you dump it into a file. So we could later look at it. You can later analyze it. You could run run grep and sad and uh, less, more, whatever you want, uh, uh, Vim, um, it would be just, when there's this amount of information, you need it into a file. It would make it much easier to analyze it. Okay, so that's the first thing you uh, we do. We run s dash o into some file, cat s long. So now we can see the output of our, of our cat. It doesn't get conflicted like with the output of s like we had here, right? You just see the output, and the output of S trace is saved inside the file. So now we could, uh, for instance, just run tail on this file, and we see the last few lines of cat, of, of, of the S trace of it. Now, so, okay, we started with S trace. We now have it uh, in the file. What do we do with this information? So let's start with some. Uh, um, with some background. I told you what system, uh, what system calls are. Another thing that's, uh, that's important to understand is that in Linux, everything is a file descriptor. If you open a file, you get a file descriptor. If you open a directory, you got a file descriptor. You can open a device, either a block or character device. A uh, network socket is a file descriptor. A Unix socket is a file descriptor. A pipe is a file descriptor. Everything is a file descriptor, okay? Every time you want to interact with, with something like that, you get a file descriptor, which is a number, and from that moment on, you use this file descriptor for any other um, action you want to do. So now that we know that, let's start looking at some important system calls for I.O. So the first two is open and close, okay? So with open, you give it uh, some uh, path, the, the, uh, path name, right? Uh, like a string of, the file, the path of the file I want, I want to open. You give it some flags, uh, which doesn't matter for now. Like you want to, see, you say if you want it to be read only or write or read write or whatever, and you get a file descriptor. You get a number. Okay, when you open some file. Now you get a number that represents this file, and every operation from now on you do with this number. Okay. When you want to close the file descriptor, you finish with the file, just run close with the file descriptor. And now when you wa want to read, you use read with the file descriptor. You give here uh, some ad address of the buffer where you want the information to be saved and uh, how much exactly you want to read from the file. If you want to write, it's exactly the same thing. And now we'll see exactly how it works. Okay. So that's where we started. So first of all, it opens some file, temp file, and it gets a file descriptor. What's the file descriptor? What's the number of the, of the file descriptor? You can, can you see it at the end? Three, right? So number three, from that moment on, it has a number three. It's related to this file. And it can do what it can do uh, with it. So for instance, it could start this file and get some metadata about it. It could read this file, okay? So it reads from file descriptor three, it reads from the file. It says, please read, try to read uh, uh, 132 uh, kilobytes. Eventually it reads only 167 uh, uh, um, bytes because it's a short file. But anyway, it reads from that. It tries to read again, but that's already the end of the file, so it gets nothing, okay? And once it finishes, it closes the file. Who's that? Great, so that's one of the things that's fairly simple, but I didn't know before. And suddenly, I understand, I understood what all of those numbers tell, tell me. Now, when I started to use s -rays, there were some files, uh, there were some uh, flags that didn't exist that we'll go into later that, again, changed my life. But um, at the beginning, when I started to use s -trace, I had to do this. Like, it would be pretty difficult. I, I saw that it was reading something from a file. 
But in order to read, to know what this file for, uh, was, like I saw read three. Again, cat is very simple language, right? Uh, sorry, very simple tool. It opens something, reads, uh, reads it, writes it, that's it. But sometimes there are tools that are much more complicated. You open a file and then you start reading, uh, uh, reading from it only like 100 or 200 lines later after it already spawned other processes. And you see this number here and it's really difficult to know what exactly number three here means. You need to go up and search for the last open that had this, that returned three. But anyway, we'll talk about it later. Um, now about the string size. So as I said, by, de by default, it just reads, it just, whenever it reads some string or writes some string, it only reads uh, 32 bytes, that's it. So for instance, look at this file. This file, it's total size of 167 characters. The first line is 32 characters long, okay? When we read from the file, especially when we say here, uh, please read uh, 132 kilobytes from the file, we will expect to see the entire, um, uh, the, 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 the entire content of the file, but it's not what happens. We only see the first 32 characters. When it writes to file descriptor one, which is standard output, again, it only shows the first 32 bytes. It doesn't show the rest of the lines. So that's why we use the dash s when we tell, we tell please increase the string size. And now we see the entire content of the file. Of course, the uh, backslash n is new line, right? So this is a line. So now you see the entire content of the file. You also see when it writes it, the entire content. Again, compare it here when it only shows the first 32 bytes to here when it shows the entire content of the file. This is 256, but sometimes you need to use something bigger. Sometimes you need to, to use um, um, even 30 to, uh, um, 130 kilobytes, right? Um, sorry, it's one, 128 <laughs> kilobytes, of course. Now, okay, that's something I already, I, I already said, that it, sometimes it's difficult to know what every file descriptor represents, what three represents. So here, okay, we see that uh, three is the file descriptor that we get by opening temp file, but sometimes it's not that difficult, uh, sometimes it's not that easy. And here comes the other flag that a lot of people don't know because it's, because it's relatively new. When I'm saying relatively new, it's about like 50 years. But, you know, people, people that started to use it before that didn't uh, realize there's a, a new flag that would help them. And people that started using s after that learned from the people that used it before that that didn't know that <laughs> this uh, flag existed. But there's a flag called dash Y, which shows you every file descriptor exactly what it's, what it's showing. That's amazing. You have no idea how great it was to discover it. <laughs> Again, so now it reads, it reads from the file. You see, it reads from temp file. When it writes somewhere, you see, it writes to the TTY, 246. When it closes the file, you see, it closes temp a file. You don't just see some number that you know that you need to scroll up and look for the, uh, what this number presents. You have it here. When you have dash YY, it will also translate sockets, which is also amazing. And we will see an uh, ex example for that later. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Th that's exactly what happens, and that wh and that's what made it so difficult before the dash y flag existed, because you had to kn to know exactly which like you, you had to search for the last open with this uh, uh, file descriptor. Not to mention that sometimes, that sometimes like with sockets. You get a you first get the file descriptor and then you assign it to some IP. It's it's been a nightmare like to, to understand which socket is talks to and using why it's just so easy. It's just like until this very day when I use Azure, I'm like, oh my 
God, I have dash y. I have dash y. Uh. OK, so dash y. So we saw what happened when we uh, just use uh, cat from a file, and we write the input uh, to the TTY, right, to the terminal. Uh, what happens if we dump it to another file, if you dump cat to another file, like to tap output file? So this time, you would see that it writes that file descriptor one will go into temp output instead of the TTY. Now file descriptor one goes into temp output. Again, makes it much easier. What happens if I redirect um, uh, file descriptor two, uh, the standard error, right? So now standard error goes to temp error, and this time I will try to uh, to uh, cat a file that is missing. So you will see it writes into file descriptor 2, which is the file temp error. It will, will write cat temp missing, no such file or directory, backslash n. So all of those will be in, a, in one line. Then you, then you will get uh, a new line. What happens when you do it into uh, a pipe? Again, it will, this time it will run into a pipe. Um, so for instance, we cut the file into sort, and you will see that instead of writing to the terminal, or instead of writing to a file, um, this time it will run into a pipe. Now, there, later on, there is, uh, so you will need, you, you will need to, to know what to do with this pipe, and I won't get into that later because I don't have the whole day to explain you all the ways that you could use S-Trace, but at least you know that this is a pipe. It writes, it, it writes into a pipe. And the verb, the verb was fra, uh, flag that in the slide where I told you like the perfect S-Trace command, I didn't write dash B, but I wrote at the beginning, at the, at, at the end, that sometimes it's useful. Look here, when we run fstat on the file, we want to get the, uh, uh, metadata of the file. Uh, without V, it shows you uh, like it's just a short, um, like uh, you, you, it gets, after that it gets some uh, struct with all the information of the file. It shows you only part of the struct, but if you use dash V, it will show you the entire struct. It will show you the device, it will show you the inode, uh, the mode, for instance, right? Uh, the the uh, permissions, number of links, the uh, UID, the GID of the file, the block size, number of blocks, uh, size of the file, uh, access time, uh, uh, change time, um, uh, mod uh, modify time, everything you see here. Many times you don't need it. It will make your file longer and sometimes more difficult to read, but many times it is very, very, very helpful. So you just need to know about dash v. OK. Uh, so now we saw, we learned a little bit about read and write, like open files. Now let's talk about execution, how it executes processes. So for instance, you have a shell, right? You run some command. How does this magic happen? I mean, how do you have new process running, executing something, and then returning to the shell. So let's see about that. Here are some more important system calls. So in the beginning, we had a system call, call, system call called fork. Today, fork again, it's not a system call. But uh, um, today, uh, fork is, again, a library call that is a uh, um, um, wrapper for an for the actual system calls, which is clone. But in the past, just, just for simplicity, I'll talk about fork, okay? Because that's probably what many of you know, and it's much easier. With fork, you just run fork, that's it, and it creates a new process. And it returns a PAD. So from that moment, when you run fork on a process, it clones, it splits. From that moment, there are two processes that have exactly the same memory. They are at the exact same place in the code, but one of them is the parent, one of them is the child. 
How do how do they know? I don't know if you ever uh, watched the uh, there is an animated show in Amazon, um, Invincible. Uh, it's a um, superhero show, and one of the villains there is someone who has a clone. And every time that one of the clones uh, one of the clone dies, he spawns another clone, and they always argue who's the original one. They never know. Like they do everything together, but they always try to like, I'm the original one. No, I'm the original one. You're the clone. You know. So they don't. They have no way to know that until one of them gets uh, uh, burned half of, of his face, and from that moment, the other one knows that he's the original one. So <laughs> anyway, because they also also share the same memory. Like they, the, the clone when get up. It's, it has the same exact memory as the original one at that specific point of time. So that's what's happened here. So how do they know which is the father, uh, which is the parent, which is, which is the child? So it's pretty easy. So fork returns something. It, on success, it returns the BID of the child to the parent. So the parent will get here some number and it will know, okay, I'm the parent. So. From, from I will do whatever the parent needs to do, and the child, like you will, uh, the, the child, the same moment, like after the fork, it will get inside of, instead of a PID, it will get zero. So the child will say, "Oh, I'm the child, so I will do something different. I will uh, do what, or something that I need to do." Anyway, fork was very simple. Uh, today, uh, as I said, it's not really a system call. It's a, it's a library that uses clone because clone is something, fork you, it creates another process where uh, the memory is duplicated. Uh, with clone, you could also create threads. Which, and the difference between just, uh, uh, um, just a child and a thread is that the ch with a child, you don't share the memory like the memory is duplicated, with thread, you have the same memory. You all use the same memory, okay? So with clone, you could do either this on that or, or, or that. Like when you use child stack zero, it, it's used as a fork. You know that uh, it creates a child and not a thread. Um, and you will see about that. Now, the parent, when it, uh, it runs fork, Okay, it gets the PID of the child. It knows that now it's the parent. It needs to wait for the child to finish. Okay, so we just wait. Remember that wait from before? Now I understand what wait, what, what wait does. And like, when I discovered that, I was like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot, like, <laughs> it's waiting for something. I don't know what it's waiting. It's bugging the code. Okay, no, it was waiting for a child to finish. <laughs> now I know that. So it just, it waits, uh, not just for a child to finish, it waits for any state change uh, of the child uh, to get some information about it, okay? Um, so uh, one of them might be, it, it could get like sig child signal that tells it that the child finished. Um, you could wait for a specific PID or you could just say PID minus one, which will wait for any child to finish. Um, and without this call, like if the parent just lets the child uh, run and doesn't wait for it, the child will become something that you might know as a zombie state. Zombie state means that the child finished, it's dead, but no one collected it. It waits for, it, for someone to just tell it, to, 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 to ask, are you done? Okay, what's, uh, just, Tell me a few things. Uh, how long did you take running? How much memory you, you took? Uh, how much CPU? Okay, that's it. Now you could go to heaven or whatever. Um, not every time you will need this information, but every time the, process, the parent will need to collect to harvest the child, to say, okay, that's it. I know that you're done. I acknowledge the fact that you finished and you could go to the next world. Um, exec VE. Now, as I said, when you run fork, you duplicate the memory. You're in the same place. You're the same. You're almost the same program with the same memory. Only one is the parent, one is one is a child. What happens if now the child wants to execute another program? So that's why execve exists. That's why what we use to run a new program, and this pr program will will replace 
the previous one. Once you run exec VE, the pro everything in the program changed. Like the memory is wiped out. It has a new memory. It has new instructions. It has everything new. Okay. Once you run exec VE, you cannot go back. Okay. That, that, that process that you run here replaces the current process that you have. Um, and again, we will see that. And another system call is exit group. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, right? It's exit. You just exit. I finished. Bye-bye. So first of all, remember that the S trace with the wait for dash uh, uh, minus, uh, uh, minus one, but I, I don't know, it's waiting for something. Now I know. What is it waiting for? It's waiting for any child to finish. How can I know which children this process has, for instance? It, there's a command called ps3, OK? So I look at ps3 and say, oh, OK, this is bash. It has a child called CPU hogger, which runs. So now I know that bash is waiting for the child to finish. And if I wait, so first of all, now I can run S trace on the child and see what happens to the child. That's what I should have done back then when I became, uh, uh, when I just became an engineer. I should have checked the, the children and run S trace on the children uh, because I know that it's waiting for the child. Uh, so I could run uh, S, S trace on, on, on the child to see what happens. But anyway, when the child finishes, what will happen? This wait will become, will, will show you exactly that it stopped. That's it. So it will, so the wait system call will exit, okay? Because usually uh, wait, you could tell it either to block or not block, meaning wait indefinitely until a child process, uh, uh, until your child finishes or check if any child has uh, finished and if not, continue. In this case, uh, it's it's blocked. It's uh, um, okay. Stopped. Like wait until exit. Never mind. But anyway, it got the uh, uh, signal, uh, the sick child, which means like the uh, uh, sig signal for the kernel telling it one of your children finished, and the wait finishes, and it says here this is the PID of the program that finished. Okay, this is fairly easy. Let's, let's, you know what, first let's try to understand again everything I explained you so far. So we have a process, okay? Let's say it has PID 222, two, two. that's the parent. The parent wants to, uh, uh, to spawn another child that will run some different command, okay? So what is it doing? It runs fork. Now there's another uh, uh, process, a child. Which, is, which exists at the same exact place in the code. And it has the same memory of, uh, 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 in the code as the parent. So again, as I told you before, how does, how does this one knows is the parent, this one knows is the child? So the parent will get the PID of the child, which is two to three. So it knows, oh, okay, I'm a parent. And the child will get uh, uh, zero from the fork, so it will say, okay, I'm the, ch uh, I'm the child. So, as I said, the parent will say, okay, I'm the parent, so I will just continue doing whatever I'm doing. Uh, and the child will say, okay, I'm the child, since I'm the child. And that is something that, that should be inside the code, right? Like when someone writes a code, it does fork, if uh, the uh, 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 return of fork is zero, then please run exit, for instance, okay? so. Okay, I'm the child, I want to run another uh, executable. So I will run exec VE with something else. From that moment on, notice right now they have the same color because they, they have the same memory, duplicated memory, but from that moment on that it ran exec VE, it runs a new program and the memory is replaced by the new program, okay? So it runs a new program doing whatever it's doing it finishes, it runs exit group, and it says, and the kernel will send uh, a sick child to the parent saying, hey boss, I'm done, okay? But until the parent doesn't see that, what happens to the child? Until the parent doesn't run wait 
to collect the child, what will happen to, to the child? It will become a zombie, right? The child is finished, but the parent hasn't collected it yet. But anyway, at some point, uh, uh, I mean, uh, hopefully uh, earlier than, uh, uh, rather, uh, rather than later, it will run wait, and it will get the PID of the child. And from that moment on, okay, that's it. Uh, I'm cleaning the child from the process table, the child doesn't exist anymore, and the parent can continue. Okay, now let's see, let's look at some more complex uh, example. Um, when you run in the shell, for instance, something with pipes, PS, pipe, sort, pipe, less. It needs to actually spawn three children. One, child, one child would, would run PS, one child would run sort, one child would, would run less. So the shell will fork three times. It will get three different processes, one with PAD, uh, each one with a different PAD. Uh, the first one will run exec for less, the second one will get exec for sort, the uh, third one will get exec for PS. The uh, order doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really, uh, um, uh, doesn't matter here, and they each speak with the other through a pipe, and when, uh, whenever one of them finishes, uh, they will, uh, the parent will get sick child and will need to wait for them, okay? So, let's see how it happens. And so I run S-Trace on a shell. Okay, I took my shell, I run S-Trace on a shell, then in the shell I run PS pipe, sort, pipe, less. And I check what happens, and I will show you the S-trace of this, of only the relevant files, uh, uh, system calls. I removed all of the uh, rest of them. I removed the read and write and everything. Uh, I only show you here the clone, the exec VE, the wait, the exit group, everything, okay? So even here, you look at that, the first number, when, I, when you run S-trace dash F, and that's the important find, uh, part, because I run S trace dash F, so I know, so I could see, so S trace will all, also trace the, the children. Without that, it will only trace the bash. You will see the clone, but you won't see any information about the children. That's why you need dash F. But still, it looks very complicated. But don't worry, I'm here for you, and I will try to make it easier. So as I said, the first number is the PID of the um, uh, of the process with the system call. So let's try first to separate them according to that, okay? So we have here, this is the father, okay? So let's say the father will be the blue one. Again, don't worry, I will make it easier, but just, you know, the, 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 uh, as a, as, as, as a uh, preparation, okay? So the blue one, or whatever, the cyan one, this is the, uh, the parent, the red one will be the PS, uh, the yellow one will be the sort, the green one will be the less, okay? But, okay, so still a little bit difficult. So let's look at each child one by one. So the parent, it runs clone um, with, um, and it gets the PID of the, of the child. So now wherever we see one, one, eight, four, two, we know that this is, we can find it, okay? And we can see that the child runs PS, it runs exec VE PS. Um, sometimes you will see that it doesn't finish the system call because, you know, uh, when you have multiple cores, not even when you have multiple cores, but you know, the, the uh, kernel, it, it's, it schedules things, like it, it, it uh, could like remove stop one of the processes at, a single, uh, at, a, at some time to replace it with some other process because it needs to run multiple processes at the same time. So sometimes the, uh, pr the kernel stops the process in the middle of the system call and moves it to another process. So that's why sometimes you will see here, okay, I started some system call, you don't see the end until eventually it resumes. So in, th in this case, right, it, uh, uh, first it got cloned, then the uh, parent, the bash, started another clone. In the middle of that clone, 
started the exec, but then the other clone resumed. So the exec resumed, but anyway, that's about it. That's about it. When it finishes, when PS finishes, it writes exit group. It exits with it exits with one. The parent gets sick child um, with the PID of the child, which is again the PID of PS, and then it needs to run wait with minus one. Again, one minus one means wait for any child, okay. And um, again, it doesn't finish here, but it does finishes here, and it gets the PID of the child. So it cloned, it got the PID of the child, the child ran exec, it became PS, PS ran, showed you the uh, list of the, of the processes in the machine, it finishes, the parent got a uh, 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 signal, sick child, meaning that's it, I'm, uh, the, the child finished, it runs wait, and that's it, release the child. The same would go for, of course, sort, so again, clone, it gets another PID here. Right, so again, the parent, the bash, it runs three clones because it needs to run three process, PS, sort, and less. It runs three clones. The first one was for PS, the second one was for sort. And it's exactly the same. It gets the uh, uh, PID um, of the clone. This is a mistake. This should should have, uh, have been here. I should have uh, marked it with, with gray also. Sorry, but anyway, it gets <laughs> PAD, uh, and now the child will run exactly. E. It would run sort, exit, sig child, wait, blah blah, and again with sort with the less at the end. Clone. It gets the PAD of clone, and uh, it's running, um, and. Less is just running there in the background until you don't press Q to finish it. Uh, to finish it, Bash will just keep it running. Okay, so now we have that. So we finished the basis. Now let's look at some real life examples that I, that we used S-Trace to save the day. Um, so we learned some serious S-Trace kung fu now. It's gonna Use this kung fu. Let's try to actually to actually solve some problems. We'll begin with something uh, relatively simple. Fill in the blank. What does it mean? We have a process. The process, as you can see in top, you. I hope you're all familiar with top, or most of you, right? So we can see in top that it consumes almost 100% CPU. It's running all the time, 100%, 100%. I want to know why does it consume so much CPU? So I run a trace on it. I take the PID of this process, and I run a trace. That's what I see, attached and nothing else. How can it be? How can it be that the process consumes 100% CPU but S trace is empty. S trace returned nothing. He has no system. He has no right. He doesn't run any system calls. What does he do instead? Just running some code on the CPU. Right? So let's look at that command CPU hogger. Right? As I said, nothing here. Let's look at the. At, 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 so I run uh, control C, okay? Um, because it doesn't do anything. And I look at the code and I see it's a Python script that just runs loop, indefinite loop, while true, pass. So that's what it's doing. No system calls here. Uh, in some, so here, you know, it's a, it's a dumb example, but in some cases you will need to use something else, maybe GDB or something like that, but it doesn't matter. At least you know, and <laughs> again, I use a lot of s rays to help customers the customers that run uh, regressions or simulations on Linux, and some of them are not Linux experts, and they, they're not even experts of the code. They got the code from someone else, and they're just running it, and they say, why is it slow? So at least you can come to the customer, and, <laughs> and for the customer, they always blame first the system. They always say, 
there's a bug in the OS because it doesn't finish. That's always like the first thing. And they ask you, what's the problem with the OS? What did you do this time? Why does my process uh, doesn't work? You know, and you need to prove to the customer that it's not your fault. It's the program's fault. So you show them that. You show them the asterisk and, and you say, you see, no output. It means that the problem is in the code. Bye-bye. I'm going home. Um, and the customer will need to either talk with the developer of the tool, run GDB or something else, but that's it. You finished your job. Next, so slow. We have two machines, okay? Host 001, host 002. I'm running SSH from both of them to some other machine. Um, one of them will finish after two seconds, okay? Because it takes like two seconds to connect to the other machine start uh, all of the authentication and everything, uh, and eventually finish. But the first one runs seven seconds, five seconds more. Why? What's the difference? What? Yeah. What's the XE? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Let's, let's see. Let's check. Um, what, what's the difference between them? Uh, by the way, here, uh, I, I simplified a little bit. I uh, changed some flags for SSH. Uh, because uh, actually it was much more, it was like 30 seconds longer, but I wanted to make it a little bit uh, easier and more understandable, so I, I, I changed some of the SSH options to not, never mind, you'll, you'll see later what I mean. So I'm running SSH with under S trace, now I'm using the dash T flag, uh, capital T, which means I will see how long every system call ran, okay? And now I start, start looking at the output of S3. So now I assume that some system call ran for a long time, or at least few system calls ran for a long time, and I want to find those system calls. So using the dash capital T, you can see I get the how long every system call ran, okay? So this is milliseconds, okay? Or, yeah, uh, microseconds, whatever. Um, you want, now we want to somehow find the longest system calls, so system calls that took longer to finish. How do we do that? So usually, you know, we, I love usually to, to, to make it interactive and, uh, and to ask people and uh, to, to ask for some answers, but here, you know, the, yeah, you, I will need to bring you the, the microphone and everything, so I'll just give you the answer, okay? <laughs> but we'll not think about, about it together, but I need somehow to, to be able to sort those lines according to the time. So there are many ways to do that, but what I want to do is I want to take this part of the number and put it at the beginning of the line so I'll be able to sort it, okay? So there are many ways to do that, sad, Oh, whatever, I'm using oct in this case, okay? So I'm telling it time is dollar nf, which is the last field. I'm telling it please remove those um, greater do, uh, um, and you know, those signs. And then I print the time and dollar zero, which is the line. Great, now I have at the beginning of, of each line I have exactly how long it ran. Now, it's gonna be pretty easy to sort it, right? I just run sort. And I run tail because I only want to see the, the, the last one. Lo and behold, we have some system call that ran for five seconds. We have this pool here that ran for five seconds and then exit with a timeout, so great. First of all, we know that there's one system call that explains exactly the difference between two seconds and seven seconds. This is this, this poll here. Now let's try to understand what this poll does. Where, does, where did it come from? So first of all, this is here. Um, it goes to port 53. Anyone knows what port? DNS. DNS. DNS, exactly. Right, 53 is DNS. So let's look here what happens. It goes to some DNS 
uh, server and it gets a timeout after five seconds. Um, and you could see using the dash uh, lowercase tt that you have the timestamp of each one. So you see, you see it has the pole here. And after five seconds, you see the next line in S race because this one got stuck. Now let's try to understand this pole, exactly what it's doing. So as I told you, again, one of my greatest discoveries of all time, we have man. Let's run man on pole and let's try to understand what's going on here, okay? So Paul, it just says, wait for some event on some file descriptor. Okay, okay. It says, we can see that it gets uh, file descriptors, it gets some NFDS, it gets some timeout, it looks interesting, it looks uh, like it might be, like it might explain. It, it says it performs something similar to select, you could also read about select. Uh, it waits uh, for uh, for one of a set of file descriptors to become ready to perform I/O. What what does it mean to perform I/O? Either read or write. Okay. So what is the file descriptor here? The file descriptor is some UDP port, UDP socket, to the, to the name server, and it waits for. So in this case, we only have one file descriptor. Sometimes it might wait for more file descriptors. Sometimes it, must, it might have multiple sockets and just wants to wait until one of those sockets is ready for reading or output or whatever. Um, so it could wait for multiple sockets at the same time, uh, multiple file descriptors at the same time. In this case, it just waits for one of those, okay? So it waits for this file descriptor to become ready to perform IO. It waits for this socket to the name server, to the DNS server, to become ready to perform I.O. What exactly does it try? Okay, let's continue. Um, so we continue in the man. And now we learn something about the timeout. What is this timeout? Timeout specifies number of milliseconds that Paul should block waiting for the file script to change. So we see it's waiting for 5,000 milliseconds, which is five seconds. So it waits for something in the file descriptor to change. It waits for the file descriptor state to change, for, uh, to, to be ready for something that we're not sure what is it yet. But anyway, it waits for it and it also tells the system call, wait for five seconds. If after five seconds you, the file script doesn't change, bye bye, okay? So what, what exactly is it waiting for? Let's continue reading the man. And we can see here something about Paul in, which looks pretty similar from here. So what Paul in is? Paul in means there's a data to read. Okay, there's a data to read. So what does it mean? We wrote something to this port, to the name server, and now we're waiting for a response. What did we send to the socket? We sent it. We're, we run SSH on some address, right? My SSH.intel.com. Uh, we need to wait for the IP of this, right? So we're sending something to the, uh, to the DNS server. We're waiting for the IP. After five seconds, the server doesn't answer. Why? Maybe the server is down. Maybe there's a, uh, uh, maybe there's a load on the server. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, something, there's some problem with, with the server. So that's why. It, there was a timeout. It waited for five seconds. It can't wait forever. And thank God we have this, op uh, this option to wait for five seconds because if not, SSH will just get stuck forever waiting for something that might never respond, right? So it waited for, uh, waited for five seconds, didn't get, uh, didn't get an answer. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Um, okay, so let's take a closer look. So we have Two IP, two sockets that we see here. One with one IP, 10, 2, 48, 2, 13, and the other one is 10, 1, 84, 9, 9, okay? And we can see, okay, it creates one socket, it gets PID numbers. Oh, by the way, this is an important thing. Um, remember the dash Y 
that I told you about that shows you uh, the, uh, uh, that translates every file descriptor to the file. So if you run two Ys, dash YY, it will also show you the sockets. And this is also another thing that's great. Before that, without the YY, you will only see poll three. And then you will need to go somewhere and search for some, what does three, uh, three mean. Using YY, you see here exactly the meaning of this file descriptor. Anyway, so you can see it creates a new datagram socket, which is UDP. It gets, uh, uh, it assigns it to file descriptor number three. It tries to connect to this, right, with UDP. It tells it, please, please connect to this address, to this port, right? This is the address, this is the port. Now it runs another poll, but this time it runs poll out. Poll out means uh, uh, wait for the, for the, file, for the file, file descriptor to be ready for me to write something, right? Great. You can write there because UDP, you know, you don't, you, you don't have the three-way hand, uh, uh, handshake. You just said something and hope it will arrive. So you will send something and Again, I, I'm simplifying it. I'm removing like a lot of the, of the information there. To, 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 uh, but you will see here a lot of text here. But you can see it sends a message to this IP saying something with my SSH Intelcom. Now it waits for the IP for the DNS. Um, but as I said, it runs the poll. It gets into the timeout of five seconds. So now, okay, I will cre it creates another socket, this time number four. It will connect to this socket, this time to another IP. Again, pull out, waiting for, for to, to be ready for output. Uh, send message. Again, ask them, what is the IP of my SSH Intelcom, please? And again, it pulls it, but this time it finishes. Hurrah. This time it doesn't stop on the on the timeout, and it gets the uh, um, uh, file descriptor um, of the of the uh, socket, and this time it reads from this. So it knows that we have something waiting in this UDP socket to read from. So this time it reads from it, and it says, "Okay, this the result of the." Uh, uh, IP of my SSH, again, you will not see it here because I removed it, but it will get like some binary data, uh, hexadecimal, like, yeah, binary data with the IP of the server. How much time is the result that Yeah, we got it. So why, why, what's the difference? I showed you at the beginning, there are two different machines, one, runs for seven seconds, the second one runs for two seconds. So we want to know why we have this difference and where does it get this IP from? So if you know a little bit about name servers, like you do, you know that it takes it from uh, etsyresolve.com. But as I said, S-Race is not just a tool for, for debugging and troubleshooting. Many times it's a tool to learn, even if you don't know and it's reading it from uh, from result.com, you will find it in S-Trace. So I get it, but why is it using this name server? There's, I, we know that there's one server, what's uh, one server, name server, uh, uh, which is probably down. Where does it get it from? So we search for this IP, right? This one, the IP that gets stuck on, let's search for it in S-Race, and we see, ooh, okay, it reads from, actually what you said, result.conf. It reads from result.conf, and it has three lines, domain, intel.com, name server. It's difficult for me to read it, so let's, let's uh, um, try to, you know, to see exactly how it, looks, uh, how it looks like. So I'll run some sed in order to get only what's inside the quote, so I get this one, and now, I take this and I run it with printf, um, which will take all of those meta characters and display them correctly. So that's exactly what it reads, what it reads from result.conf domain and then two name servers. 
The first one is the one that got stuck on. The second one is the one that worked. And if we cat resolve count, that's exactly what we'll see. And on the second host, if we cat resolve conf, which with an embarrassing typo that I did, because it shouldn't work, it should be without an E, but uh, never mind. Um, in the second one, it only has the second name server, so it doesn't get stuck on the first one. Another problem solved with S trace. Uh, that's, yeah, we, we won't go there. <laughs> Next one, this is a little bit similar to that one. I'm sorry, I, my imagination is quite limited. And uh, I, I had different examples that, that were related to our specific environment, but I didn't want it to be like too complicated. I wanted to, so, uh, to show some examples that will be familiar by, by everyone. So this is a little bit similar. This time, I'm using ping, I'm using ping my SSH. I'm using it as two users. If I run it under my user, under a Rosenfeld, this is my, my username, Avikam Rosenfeld, it tells, shows unknown host, my SSH. But if I run it with the root, it succeeds. It shows my SSH intel.com. That's, just, that, that, that's not fair. That's like the system is discriminating between me and root. That's because I don't have privilege levels. It shouldn't run for me. OK, let's use S trace. Let's try to use S trace to understand what's going on here. And that's another way I use S trace sometimes when I know that something works in one place and doesn't work in another place or works by one user and doesn't work by another user. I run two S traces and I'm trying to find the differences. That's one of those, um, um, one of those ways I'm using S trace. So let's do it. So let's run S trace for this ping. Um, one other my user with, will write the file to S user and one under root, okay? And Let's try to compare the files. Now, there are different things that could, could cause it. I assume I have a hunch that maybe, like, okay, what could be a reason that something will work as root and will not work as a user? Yeah? Permissions. Permissions, right. And permissions usually go for files. So I assume, I assume there's some file that root could open but uh, my user cannot open. So I will grab for open. I will check which files it tries to open. I will also sort them uh, to, uh, for it to be e easier to compare. I'm using the dash u unique, so it would, uh, so it will not show um, uh, repeated uh, files that it opened multiple times. And now I'll try to compare, okay. So, great, so it opens here host.conf and here. Then it opens Etsy host and here ldbaba. Do you actually see the difference? Yeah, of course you do. So here it tries to open resolve conf and gets permission denied. And here it doesn't. And the file tries to open is resolve conf. So, okay, let's, let's check it out. I'm trying to cut this file. Indeed, permission denied. I'm running, I'm running LS. Oh, okay. So root has permission. So only root has permissions to read this file. Others cannot read this file. Okay. And when I run it with as root, I can see domain intelcom. And that's the thing. I ran the ping without the FQDN, without the fully qualified domain name. It had to check. When I run my SSH, it had to find its domain name. And that's something that you see in resolve.conf. You know, it, it should try it with mysh.intel.com. If I would run ping with mysh.intel.com, uh, 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 intel that might have worked. Um, so, yeah, another one. Um, I think 
this might be the last case here. So here it's not really a problem. Here the problem is actually with S trace. Okay, there isn't a problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to understand why S trace doesn't work. So let's say I'm trying to run sudo. I'm trying to just run sudo echo hello. Let's say I have some problem with sudo. Never mind right now what the problem is, but I have a problem with sudo and I want to run S trace on this. So I'm trying to run S trace. Now, when I run it without S trace, sudo works, okay? Again, <laughs> like, sudo show will show me something different, but in this case, it shows me something else. It says, effective UID is not zero. Is user being sudo on a file system with a node? What? And if it, what? What happens here? So I know, okay, but I still want to run asterisk on the sudo. It doesn't let me. It tells me something about UID. Okay, how does sudo work? How does sudo or su work? Uh, anyone knows? Like, how is it possible that me, as a regular user that is not root, how can I become a different user? So sudo has the set UID bit. I don't know if you heard about it, set UID bit means that it will run with effective UID as root. And due to that, it, will, it, it runs with elevated privileges and it could change the username, it could change the uh, UID. Uh, the, 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 the effective or the real uh, UID or, or uh, whatever it means, that's how sudo works. Now with S trace, when you're running S trace, S trace cannot run set UID binaries. That's a security, a security risk because if you run S trace as a regular user on something that, sh that has elevated privileges, you might see some information that you should not be able to see. Maybe it reads some secured file that only root could, uh, could read, and we don't want the user to be able to read. So using s -trace, you will be able to see that. We don't want that. So what will we do, okay? We know that that's the problem. What do we do if we want to run s -trace on sudo? So we're in a pickle here, because sudo, I run sudo as a regular user, but as a regular user, I cannot run. Uh, um, I cannot run S trace on sudo. I can only run S trace on sudo as root. But as root, I cannot run sudo. Only a regular user can run sudo. Sorry. Yeah, but but then uh, you you can't run. But then S trace will run as sudo. It will run as root. But then you run another sudo. And this, the, uh, the another sudo will not run as the root, will, as the user, it will run as root because you run as root as root. So you encapsulate the sudo echo hello in a script and then just S trace the script? It will not, it, 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 it will still be the same. Yeah, because, it, because still it will try to say, it, it, it will try to run it with, with user. Here's what we do. I told you that there are two ways to run S trace. One of them is to run it using a command, right? Here, I'm using uh, S trace sudo echo hello. The other one, I could attach it to a process that's already running using its PID. So let's say I want to S trace it as root, but I want to S trace command running as my own user. What will I, what will I do? I open another shell. Oh, and by the way, yeah, if I look into the S trace, here's what I see. Gets UID, uh, the, uh, UID, this is my UID, blah, 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 it writes everything. Okay, I'm running, I'm checking the PID of this shell. Okay, echo dollar dollar, this is the PID of the shell that I'm running. Now, now I'm opening another window on the same host. Now I become root, sudo sudo. Now, I'm root on the same host. Now I can run sudo, the same sudo command, okay? But this time, I attach it to this process, right? Attached. Now, I run here again, sudo echo hello. 
and I see that it creates new process. Now it works because now the S trace runs as root, but the sudo runs as the user. And this is something that I, I, I want you to always remember. It's every time, you, 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 like sometimes people just run to run S trace on the, on the uh, 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 process that fails. But sometimes you need to think what this process is, where did this process come from? Like for, for instance, here, this process, who starts this process, the uh, echo hello? It was the shell that started it, right? Let's say you SSH somewhere. I s showed you a problem with SSH where the problem was on the client, right, with resolve conf. Sometimes the problem is on the server. So what would you do then? Sometimes you will need to run S trace on the SSH daemon on the server, okay? So that's what you need to remember, that sometimes you don't need to trace the exact process that has the issue, but rather another process that will start it or that will speak to it or something like that. And that's what happens here. So this one, I, uh, so again, I S trace to the shell. Inside the shell, I use the dash F, so it will show me the children of the, uh, the children of the shell. Now I see it has some process attached. Eventually, I, uh, I run control C, so it's detached. And now let's compare, okay? That's what we see on the first one that failed. What we saw here is it runs get EUID. What is the effective UID of the process? It's not zero, zero is root, right? It's something else. And also it stats user bin sudo, and it says, oh, this is set UID. Okay, that's what he sees here, this is set UID. So sudo by itself, it checks if you're allow, if you're root, and if you're not root, it will tell you, okay, you cannot run this. And you're not, and when you just run S trace on sudo, you will not become root because S trace doesn't allow to run set UID. That's why we ran it as root for another one. And there we will see exec VE, get EUID. This time it's zero. And this time it worked. Um, yeah, that was the last slide. Um, yeah, uh, so again, just, I, first of all, you could find the slides if you want in the, uh, in the website, right? I uploaded it, I uploaded a PDF with all of the slides so you can see there all those uh, examples, all the flags that I recommend using. Um, and yeah, you just need to think about what system calls are, you need to try to run it with those flags. And uh, that's it, I think I'm ready for questions. Any question? Wait a minute, I think we need somehow, oop. No. Um, is running multiple CPUs change the way we use S-Rush? No, no, it will not because it doesn't matter. The only thing that will happen is, let's uh, look for the, uh, Example here. No, not this one. Yeah, here. The only thing that that will change is that you will see that sometimes um, the uh, um, some of the system call doesn't finish. It finishes in another line because maybe at the same time on another on another uh, core, another CPU, another process started. So it will uh, block those, but, but it doesn't matter you know, on which CPU it runs now. It will run the same. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah. I forget which flag that is, but 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So what he said is that um, the, 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 it's a problem here: uh, the, the interleaving of the of, of of the output of different ch uh, different children, which shows you like the unfinished and the, and the resume and everything. And there's a way to see uh, to get another log file, a specific log file for every child. So that's why, that way you will see all of the system calls finish at the same time. And this leg is dash FF. Instead of just dash F, you will use dash FF. And then in the dash O, you write the prefix of the file. So not just the file name, you get dash, dash FF with uh, dash FF and then in Oh, let's say you write slash temp slash s, so every process will have s.pid. And then there's actually another script called uh, strace log merge, well, where it could take all of those files and merge them back to one file. Uh, and yeah, this is very helpful sometimes. It makes things much clearer. As I said, I didn't have a lot of time here, but it's good that you mentioned it. It's a, it's a good point. Uh, read about it. Sometimes it will make things easier. You won't see all those uh, annoying unfinished resume, unfinished resume. But you know, sometimes if it's a log, if, if it's a long file, right? Sometimes you will see here the exec v resumed. Here it's pretty easy because I see it back here. But sometimes it's there are like dozens of lines between them, and you need to find where it started. So again, using this FF, it will not happen. Every every system call will finish in, in, in the same line. So thanks for the comment. Yeah. If you modify the multiple output file um, and then you try to marriage it back together after having like removed some of them, will that complain or will it just put the file the lines that are there back where they would have been? Yeah, they, they, it it will use when you try to merge them. Uh, it it tries it. So again, every you merge them after you already finished S trace. Okay, that's not related to S trace. You S trace will run uh, will run all the files, and you will need to run S trace with dash tt, which shows you. The um, the timestamp or every line. So. Either with uh, TT or TTT, does like <laughs> read in the man the difference between them. The TT is human readable. The, the TTT, <laughs> the triple T, uh, it's it, it's uh, like just the timestamp with the seconds, right? Um, but anyway, it needs those in order to to know how to merge them, in order to know which part run ran where. It doesn't know if something is is missing or not. It will just take all of those files and merge them with their PADs according to the timestamp. Uh, so the, 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 the summary, the statistics stuff, you know, the dash T or capital T, so that's like with your set and object track, you know, it does it all at once, has like a little profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get yeah. so excited when I hear it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, and actually, uh, initially, I had another I don't know if I want to show it right now. Uh, I had, you, you know what? If you if, if you don't mind, like I, I had, I, as I said, um, I had another uh, presentation about S race that I did for a work, and and some of the examples there I didn't show here, but. Here there was a different um, the problem that we saw before with the difference between root and user. I tried to think of something. That, uh, here the problem is with NIST. We're using NIS, which is something that no one should use, and no one uses it except for us because we're a dinosaur. Um, so anyway, we're, we're using NIST, and I could see that. Something when I ran something as a user, it was much slower than root. It was like more than ten times slower than root, and I didn't know why. So and, and there were uh, there were a lot of system calls, a lot of system calls. 
So I started by trying to compare, as you said, I, tr I, tr I tried to compare between them. So I run dash C, and I see some things here. I see, like, for instance, that um, when I run something as the user, it had 50, 15,000 calls for close. Wherever here, there were only 29. There were 7,000 calls for send to and poll and open and soak FD and blah, 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 blah. 7,000 as root, three sockets. <laughs> One set sock OPT. Uh, so that's where, first of all, I saw that there was some, like the differences. Why, why were the differences? Because it's not the same. It's not like the same as we, uh, as with, with the SSH, where there was one system call difference. Here we could see there are a lot of system call difference, but not only that, there is another, except for dash C, and that was the thing that I got excited to find out. Dash C shows you the seconds it's spent, but it doesn't add up, right? Like you could see here that it shows only uh, 0 .50, uh, 0 0.58 seconds, and here 0.024 seconds. But we know that the get end ran here, uh, uh, ran here for a, for more than a second. So where did everything go? So the thing is. Uh, when it only shows you the time it spent inside the kernel in a very specific time. You can add another flag, which is the dash W to the C, and then you, you, you will see the actual time that it spent in the system call, not just in kernel mode, but the entire time. And here you can see that out of all of those differences, the actual difference was in the poll, like with the time. Because, yeah, we see that send to run for, uh, uh, they ran 7,000 times and close run uh, 15,000 times, but they all, like, they didn't spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time there. But Paul, this one, spent 1 1.53 seconds in the poll. From there, I continued, like, the same as I showed in the, in, in the other example at the beginning. I just, uh, I, I run regular S trace, and here, like it was the same. I found some file that got permission denied, but yeah, but, and, and then again, I, I, I won't go into it, what, what this file means, but you need to know a little bit of NIS for that, so that's why I didn't show you this, uh, this issue, but, but there's a, some configuration files that tells you how to connect to this. And without some configuration, it will just run a lot of sockets, like write, receive, and then close the socket, start another one. Write, receive, close socket, start another, another one, instead of just using the same socket. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for that also. You're, you're a good crowd. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, you're right. Again, that's one of the things that I didn't write here because I just assumed that after what I show you here, you will read the man s trace and will, you, you will see some file. So I didn't uh, show you everything, but you're uh, completely right. Um, so for instance here, uh, I told you that I grepped, but it, it's, it's, it's not true. I actually ran s trace with the dash E flag and dash E, and I told it, please just uh, just trace those system calls. Tra uh, uh, trace clone, uh, exec VE, exit group, and wait for. Uh, so yeah, so if you know what you're looking for, like in this case, it will be much easier to do the grep, but that's if you know what you're looking for. Many times you don't know what you're looking for, but again, yeah, sometimes, it's a really good. Uh, it's really good to use that uh, the dash e. You can also tell it to ignore some system calls. So if there are some system calls that are annoying you, that don't, that are not relevant, you can ignore them. Um, and um, 
what else can you do there? You can even you can even trace for system calls uh, that uh, are doing something with a specific path. If you want to know uh, where to read some path, you can use this also. Uh, so yeah, another another good comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually that's our time now. Um, but um, thank you very much for listening. You're a wonderful crowd. And uh, have a nice day.